First place is called Haunted. I am haunted by images. The date, 1955. The setting, Selma, Alabama. I am standing between two water fountains. One is marked colored where stained waters stir and creep forth from within. And one is marked whites only where streams of luminous waters unite and burst forth into the bright daylight. I am colored and thirsty, yet very fair skin. Two fountains, each offering temporary relief, neither without compromised wounds or scars. I am haunted by images, the date, 1985, the setting New York City. I am standing between two hospitals. One is Catholic, where viruses have been assigned morals and paintings of the Pope outnumber condoms 1,000 to none. And one is public, and under, excuse me, one is public, and un, yet underfunded and overflowing with black and brown bodies. And I'm gay, white, and sick. With every breath I trip the switches on the silent bombs now bursting within my blood. Two hospitals, each masquerading bad medicine as temporary relief, neither without compromised wounds or scars. I am haunted by images, the date, 1995, the setting Houston, Texas. I am standing between two churches. One is full gospel, Pentecostal, and rooted in the black tradition, a tradition in which sweet honey and bitter homophobia flow from the same rock. And one is white and liberal, where pastors preach of a God who dwells within and loves me as I am. Yet, is, yet it is both void of a choir and a cross. And I am black, gay, and spiritually bankrupt. Two churches, each, in, each offering up their own brand of temporary relief, one more earthly, one more heavenly, neither without compromised wounds or scars. I am haunted by images, the day 2005, the setting Seattle, Washington, I am standing between two restrooms, one marked men, one marked women. My bladder is full, and I am transgender. Though my shell is female, my nature being and knowing are fully male. Two restrooms, each offering temporary relief, neither without compromised wounds or scars. I am haunted by myriads of images, all offering temporary relief, none without compromised wounds or scars. This is for colored boys who consider suicide when the ways of this world were not enough. Going home. As a child, I often envisioned my own funeral. I'd be laid out like some rich white woman in a stunning casket, surrounded by pleasing flowers and poisonous people. Clocks would stop and stores would close in my honor. Colored folks would press their clothes and prepare tons of food for the services. White folks would dress in Chanel and Ralph Lauren. Flags would waver at half-mast, and buildings would be veiled in black bunting. Traffic would be backed up for miles and miles, with highway reader boards flashing, funeral procession in progress, slow-moving traffic, next 3,000 miles. <laughs> the processional would wind through the, through the neighborhoods of all my enemies. My tormentors would be standing shoulder to shoulder, parade rests. They would all cry hollow tears, tears that would sting their flesh, just through their words, and actions and inactions had stung my whole being. Some would come seeking a glimpse of the one they had persecuted. Others would come seeking absolution. But none would be dispensed that day. The confessional was closed. This is a day of mourning. Excuse me. A sign outside the church would read, the deceiving kind of request that all ladies of birth and choice don hats. If some ladies had forgotten their hats or didn't own one, the ladies' relief in women's auxiliary societies would make sure there were plenty to go around. Yes, hats. Big, big hats. The kind of hats that let folks know you command respect, but most importantly, you've waited all week just to wear them. I hope in heaven boys like me get to wear hats. The music would be simple, nothing grand or ostentatious. That's what caskets are for. And of course, I would have written my own eulogy. It would read, this place just ain't safe for a fat, dark, sin sissy like myself. So I've gone home to glory to reign with my Lord. See if you get there. The front pew would be reserved for a higher chorus of criers who would wail, wail like they did at Galgantha. The sound would be deafening. They would wail so loud they would drown out the voices of all the black folks who told me I was not black enough because my parents were white. So loud it would drown out the voices of all the white folks who told me they were niggers and blacks magnanimously reassured I was a ladder. So loud it would drown out the voices of everybody who told me I was going to hell for kissing boys. And the silence of those who neglected to tell me 
I didn't have to kiss every boy who wanted to kiss me. So loud it would drown out the voices of everybody who they may be gifted, articulate, or entertaining, all the while neglecting to see my frozen tears. Yes, this would be a day of wailing, at least for the higher chorus of criers. I'm on my way home. And when I get there, I'm going to walk right up to the pearly gates where I'll, met me, where I'll be met by God Almighty himself. And you know just what he's going to say. Welcome home, my child. I hadn't expected to call you home so soon, but things were, weren't safe for you down there anymore. And I reply, yeah, you're telling me. But hey, did you see my funeral? Now that was fierce. Thank you. This last piece is a brief excerpt from a one sissy show that I'm writing that will come to the stage um, next uh, May. It'll be May 18th or 19th. We'll be at the Broadway Performance Hall, and then in June we'll be at um, Rainer Beach Cultural. So look for it. Sitting in circles with rich white girls, memoirs of a bulimic black boy. I once begged a paring knife to steal my pulse from Jesus. Prayed an old frayed hanging rope would steal my breath from God. But salvation came in the form of a restroom stall. There I found shelter and self-preservation. Though merely 12 square feet and constructed of cold ceramic tiles and, stain and graffiti resistant stainless steel partitions, it would become my safe harbor, a private sanctuary. In the beginning, I would seek it out for temporal confessions, a quick purge of shame and I'd be off. During the in-between times, I would use the grab rails to support past, present, and future sins. And during the bitter end, my body battered, broken, and anchors having given me away, I simply mourned there. But most importantly, it was the restroom stall where I learned that when standing at the edge of the abyss, preparing to dive into a bottomless chasm, and retreat is not an option, then sitting down and dangling my feet over the edge, is truly a form of self-preservation, sitting in circles with, with rich white girls, memoirs of a bulimic black boy. Thank you much. That was terrific. <laughs> um, it's an honor to be here, and I want to thank Nick Licata and um, Frank Video of Nicolacata's office for organizing this, and Sienna Madrid and uh, Bob Redmond, also for organizing it, <laughs> is not here today. Um, and I also want to thank, I'm running on the McLeod Residence ticket, um, and McLeod Residence is a new gallery bar in Belltown, and um, you should definitely check it out if you haven't already. So it just opened, the, uh, the bar just opened in May. So. Um, Let's see, and I'm Anna Maria Hong. I forgot to mention my name. <laughs> so I'm gonna read five short poems, um, and I'm gonna uh, sort of plug a bunch of publications in town. So I'm gonna start with Cranky, um, which is a literary journal based in Seattle. And um, this particular issue is from 2005. It, the cover art is by um, Alan Lau, a local visual artist and poet. And um, I'll read one poem from this. It's called Patisserie du Monde. Because I am the nail bed and the bed of nails, because I am the pink and the char around the warm, because luck folds the lamb and the luck unfolding hoe, because I fingered two plums and the plumber ate one, because crass craves company and the candle kindles some of me, because I am the six, no six in line, because five said make me seven and seven tied a rope, because I am the unsigned covenant and a coven, well a coven, because line 10 marks exasperation and 10 numbers sigh O, oh, as if music swam like number, numbing the bottom half, as if geometry chased a note, as if a figment of a ghost, as if flavor staved the hung, as if well flaved a flay, as if beauty marked a question, the question parting low, as if rusty made a shiny and shiny antidote. And the second poem, <laughs> you don't have to clap. <laughs> Thanks. So the second poem I'm going to read is um, a sonnet, and it's from um, this new anthology by Rose um, Alley Press, which Victoria Ford was representing. Um, it's called Limbs of the, uh, the name of the anthology is Limbs of the Pine Peaks of the Range. I'm also in it. I'm like very grateful to be in it. Um, and we'll read one poem from this. It's called um, 
photograph of Four Tower and people of Myanmar, and it was inspired by a photograph that was in the New York Times Book Review several years ago, and it's um, this is a remarkable photograph of four people um, from the, a Tarran tribe in Myanmar, which used to be Burma. And um, the author, it was in a review of a book um, about the jade and heroin trades in Burma or Myanmar. Um, but the author, while he was doing research on this book, just kind of came across this tribe that's almost, that's becoming extinct, basically. So, photograph of four Tarran people of Myanmar. The caption says they are rapidly dying out and I cannot help but love the fierce and pyral face of the woman denying the biologist photographer's gaze. Unpreserved, that wild-haired woman is just my age. Her girl frowns, of course they know. The camera will leave little trace. Is it Cyrillic on, her, on the sister's shirt, a splash of English chalked above the door? I know nothing of this tribe and will know nothing more. And what pleasure lets the young man show an unfamiliar smile, eyes shut, hands obscure, beyond fathom of shame his whole leg reaching, the other already gone, disappearing in the frame. And <laughs> you really don't have to clap, thanks. <laughs> okay, and this one is dedicated to, um, to Buster McLeod, and I wanna thank Buster. Buster McLeod is one of the founders of McLeod Residence, um, along with Maggie Santola and uh, Lily McLeod and uh, a fourth person whose name escapes me, but um, I wanna thank especially Buster and Maggie for nominating me, so. Um, this is called Three Polar Bears. When I was one in 29, the world was round and flat as glass, and you were a lad of sun and sun. The earth was buoyed and girdled in gold and smacked of mint and honey. Bad angels ate their wings, which of course were made of marzipan. The lips of dolphins smiled at me. The lips of snakes bit the sea and bid adieu to briny lovers who rank and filed the bottom of that deep blue deep. Now you are 29 and one which we all know makes 48, like the US without Alaska and Canada. It's grand to be so continental, like hair that won't stay blue, or a priest, a rabbi, and a squirrel buying the next round. <laughs> okay, and then the last two poems I'm gonna read are prose poems. Um, they were commissioned for Arcade, the uh, Design and Architecture magazine, which is also produced locally. Um, this was a special uh, issue of Arcade called Designing Cinema, and it was about the intersection of film and architecture and it was guest edited by Charles Mudede um, of The Stranger, who asked me to write um, some of these prose poems. And uh, the series is called The Films of Zaha Hadid. Zaha Hadid is um, a, an Iraqi-born uh, architect who has lived in London for a long time. She's the first female architect to have designed a major museum in the US, the Rosenthal Center for the Arts in Cincinnati. And she's also the first woman to win the, major, the highest prize in architecture, the Pritzker Prize. So I will, I'll read two of these and then that will be it. One, a woman wraps the man in a blue flag, rolling his tongue in black fabric. Concrete pour of my golden thighs, she says, binding him like a foot, to let you feel the symbol. His arms a trundle, his tongue a mast, the flag of a known caress. He thinks about the denouement of empire, living in the pointy end of the gyre. He breaks like a sweat. You're a sapphire, love, she says. Irony will never hurt us. It will wrap you like a stone at the bottom of the sea. The man down the corridor opens his throat to listen. He remembers the smell of juniper and pine. He remembers the scent of the landlocked sea. We are all two, he says. She went. Two. We see him through a window, melting with rain. Standing by the glass wall, he shuts his eyes and opens them to make the darkness thinner. He pulls a necklace of keys from his trench coat park pocket and slides them off one by one, trying each in the lock. He does not look down. He does this by feel. One, two, three, four, a spark. Pale eyes look inward, no glint of relief. He flees down the corridor on gloved feet. The visage wary, handsomeness falling away. Later he will be shot. A wounded wolf, says the conspirator who wants to find him. Later he will commit a suicide of sorts. The pianist will evoke the double cross, bearing a glimmer of remorse. The end is confusing, the rain relentless, every interior mute. A close-up of bottles in an old armoire, a bird in a cage warns him twice. Every shot is a victory of choice. Desire a distillate ripple. The film is blued. No, the dominant color is gray. Thank you.
Thanks, Anna Maria. Um, and thank you to the Seattle Public Library for hosting this. And I appreciate all of you being here today. And I hope that you vote for someone. I hear it takes about a minute and a half um, to do so. So um, you can do that online. Um, and I've been nominated by 826 Seattle. And for me, it's an honor to be here and to be nominated by that organization. I've been a volunteer there for the past three years. And it's amazing what it sort of it's turned into. Um, it's located in Greenwood, kind of at the intersection of 85th and Greenwood. Um, and it's sort of housed behind the Greenwood Space Travel Supply Company. So if you've ever seen this place where they sell space travel supplies, um, behind that is a huge writing center. And I encourage you to kind of check it out. There are classes going on this summer. Um, and they're open during the day, uh, most days during the week. There's also a representative from A26 here today, Ted. Um, he's right here. And he can answer any of your questions. And if you have any, uh, want to pick up some materials, there's some over there. Um, I'm going to share three poems with you today that I'll deal in dreams. Um, kind of a theme that you're going to see on metro buses, I think sometime soon this year. And I uh, hope you enjoy them. Uh, my first poem's called Diane Dreams of Dale's Voice. And it's from a Twin Peaks anthology, poems that were inspired by, by the show, um, called A Slice of Cherry Pie. And um, I'm kind of embarrassed to say that that's part of the reason why I think I moved to this area, you know, some, <laughs> some 15 years ago. But uh, I'm here to stay, thanks to that show. So. It begins with an epigraph by uh, Special Agent Dale Cooper. Um, In the grand design, women were definitely drawn from a different set of blueprints. Um, and his administrative assistant was Diane, and she was someone he talked into a little tape recorder to, if you know the show. Um, and I suspect this is what she might dream of occasionally. Diane, 11.30 AM, February 24th, entering the town of Twin Peaks, and I'm holding in my hands a small box of chocolate bunnies. It struck me again earlier this morning. There are two things. Cherry pie is worth the stop, OK? And it looks like I'll be at the Calhoun Memorial Hospital. I guess we're going up to intensive care to see the Kennedys. And Diane, it struck me again earlier this morning, there are two things that crawled down the railroad tracks off the mountain. What really went on between Marilyn Monroe and 31 cents at the Calhoun Memorial Hospital? I guess we're going up to intensive care to take a look at the Lamplighter Inn. That's on Highway 2 near Lewis Fork. That's on Highway 2 near a fish sandwich on whole wheat. And get a slice of cherry pie. It's worth a stop. Lunch was uh, $6.31. When I finished, there are two things that continue to trouble me. And I'm speaking now not only as an agent of the Bureau, but also as an agent of the trees. I guess we're going up to intensive care to take a look at that girl that crawled down the railroad tracks off the mountain. When I finish, there I'll be at the Canadian border, 12 miles west of time. Mileage is 79,345. Gauge is on reserve. I'm speaking on fumes here. I've got to tank up when I get into town. Remind me to tell you how much that is. This poem is for, um, I guess, teachers out in the audience that know what it's like to lose a student and still have to give them a grade. And what I mean by lose, you know, I, I think some teachers have had students who, who, who die during the time in which they're teaching them. But I'm also talking about students that just disappear. Um, and sometimes you have work that they've completed and you're kind of wondering, what do you do with this? And I typically hang on to it. Um, and this is something that's come out of that. It's called Permanent Records. Traipsing through a black forest of grade points, you emerge to discover other marks, a distant range of mountains wavering along water's edge. I, incomplete, like Sid, who wrote before expulsion, I always made sure I wasn't sick on Tuesdays because I didn't want to miss the poetry. I had never written about solid things or things I'd done before. V is about their vanishing, their academic evaporation, like the girl whose name escapes me that wrote the story about the day her mother left her in an elevator. Just weeks into the course, before I could return her paper, she was gone. W, an official withdrawal, what I was instructed to give Brian the day after the boy died, head on, driving his mother's white car down a skinny wet road. The grade guarantees she won't receive any more mail from the college concerning her son. Z is like V but does not impact your GPA. It's what I gave Ashley when she disappeared. 
Only I don't know if she escaped the boyfriend who followed her to campus, gun under the front seat, and pulled her into stairwells and bathrooms, first a black eye and bruised ribs, then bleeding before class from where he'd cut her. I still have the first draft she turned in. Do dreams have a practical meaning? Um, this is the last poem, and um, it was inspired by turning 33 and my sister sending me, um, I don't know, a list of things 33. And uh, pardon my French in this poem, seriously, there's French in the poem, and I, <laughs> it may not be quite what it should be, so. Why would Jesus dream? The night before he knows he'll be stapled to a cross. At 33, arsenic's atomic age, and how you say cheese in Spanish. Had the crucifixion been rained out and Jesus French-Canadian, he'd have been taken to his doctor's office where she'd ask him to say, trente toi, trente toi, as she presses a stethoscope to his needled body, listening to last breaths, his lungs like an LP by Alexander the Great and the Freemasons, while her other hand would trace his spine trying to account for all 33 of his vertebrae, because that's the number a normal human being contains. Thanks. Hi there, I'm Amy Mahoney. I am a poet, a performer, a fiction writer, a student. I'm really happy to be here today, really honored to be counted among the other fabulous poets that have been nominated for Seattle Poet Populist. And uh, the piece I'm gonna do is called D.E.M. After the last election, a friend asked me why the Americans weren't doing anything, and I shrank inside myself. A young mother stands in front of the stove stirring greasy beef for hamburger helper. Before she leaves for her night job, she calls out words from her daughter's spelling list hanging on the refrigerator. Insufficient. I-N-S-U-F-F-I-N-T? Amy, come on, we've been over this three times and you got that one right before. My mother had a ninth grade education, as did her father. I was never tested for a learning disability. My education would not matter, though insufficient, it was acceptable for my class status. Democracy, D-E-M-O-C-R-A-C-Y, democracy. I know how to spell it and I know what it means, a government in which supreme power is vested in the people. I vote, I want to believe that it matters, but because I have always understood privilege from the bottom, I am suspicious of choice. Maybe the fix is in, maybe we don't count, maybe it doesn't even matter anyway, the lesser of evils and all that. The illusion of choice is a powerful means to subdue the masses, and when asked why the Americans aren't doing anything, I feel like a victim of my government and a perpetrator against the entire world, and the true story of what the Americans are or are not doing is all twisted up in the fact that we are neither and both. I don't remember my mother ever voting. I don't think she would consider herself smart enough to do so. She was a dropout, a teen mom, a welfare lifer, a maid, a cook, a janitor, a waitress. She changed bedpans as an unschooled nurse's aide, just like her mother. My grandfather was career military. Except for a brief stint in a Montana coal mine, his entire life was spent in the service. Other family jobs include landscaper, welder, mechanic. I come from a family of dropouts, pushed outs. Nothing here for me anyways. We are the skilled and semi-skilled laborers, subordinate. S-U-B-O-R-D-I-N-A-T-E, subordinate. I will do my duty to what I know is fair and true and say the working people of this nation, whether for or against the current administration, have been victims of pillage and plunder in the name of democracy. My grandfather was 17 when he was wounded in World War II at the Battle of Guadalcanal. He lied about his age because he needed a job. The front lines of our armies have always been full of boys with no better option for the poor, undereducated, and dispensable. It's touted as a great opportunity see the world, money for college. Too bad they're coming home with cancer and battle fatigue, scars and amputations. Too bad two-thirds of GI bills ain't even paying off. 
I can show you how ending up in a special ed classroom led right to trade high school. I believe having a trade is valuable and have always been taught that there is no shame in an honest day's work, but the potential of my brain has been undervalued for years. I do line work in a factory of cool 18 to 25 heads of hair a day standing on cement floors with my already bad knees and the first signs of carpal tunnel tingling through my arms with no health insurance. I'm not stupid enough to believe that my government has any more compassion for me than the people we're killing overseas. I'm just harder to bomb. You can't take out the ground you're standing on. The backs of marginalized people is the ground the American government is standing on. It's balanced on our shoulders and dependent on our labor. Rise up and they tumble, right? Rise up and quit the job that dehumanizes and underpays you, but then your children go hungry. Rise up and take to the picket lines. The lines they got us busy walking are the ones around the community clinics waiting for medication we can't afford. Rise up and risk your citizenship, your job, your freedom, be labeled a terrorist, a communist, a threat to national security, get flagged and filed. The American people have been cleverly and successfully subordinated by the powers that be. Meritocracy. M-E-R-I-T-O-C-R-A-C-Y. Meritocracy. The idea that if you work hard enough, you can be anything you want, well, it's just not true. It's forced into our heads until we, the working poor, blame ourselves for never being able to get ahead. What a brilliant plan convince us we've done this to ourselves. Sure, class mobility exists, and I can do better than my parents. But any kid can grow up to be president. It's a ludicrous lie. Too many poor schools ain't got money enough to buy history books new enough to have the last couple presidents in them. Not that our history books seem to be doing us much good these days. So back to choice. Is it a coincidence that Bush and Kerry went to the same school? You got the bad and the good of the same groom for power coin while so many American children are making it all the way through school hardly knowing what a map of the world looks like or how electoral votes are different than popular ones. And maybe that's just a coincidence too, but what I see is the powered and the privileged juxtaposed against the dispensable and the duped and there is an ocean of missing teeth, bad backs, illiteracy, welfare, lies, judicial corruption, religious conservatism, corporate domination, white supremacy, police brutality, and lies, lies, lies between most people living in this country and those who own it. When my brother went to college, he had to register for the selective service. He said if he got called up, he'd do his duty, and my blood boiled. It made me further question my ideas about responsibility and the fate of this nation. It is not the duty of my baby brother or any other young person looking for a way out or a leg up to die defending this country, this lying government, to die defending this class system, to die defending a country building more prisons than schools, to die defending this racist, homophobic, finger-pointing, fear-tactic manipulating, voter fraud perpetrating country. My grandfather served in three wars drank his liver toxic, terrorizing his family. My mother, the youngest I know, looks so old, so worn. I can't feel half the fingers in my hand trying to cut enough hair to make it through college at 29. I understand terrorism when I hear my baby brother say duty. The idea that he could spend the rest of his life with night terrors, desperate to forget what he's done to women and children, to the working poor of nations around the globe, and to boys, not so much unlike himself, both of them victims of the U.S. government. When I think about my brother's life, all of these lives potentially squandered, I get the smallest glimpse at the gruesome desire to have see buildings toppled at the feet of your righteousness, born of feeling, cornered, trapped, and trespassed against. Wrench. Shovel, mop, broom, scissors, gun. This is what my people have been allowed. I choose pen and voice. I choose to labor with my heart and my mind and speak out for what I know is fair and true and say many Americans are trying to do something, but it's a dark road out. Hi, I'm Peter Pereira. Uh, I'm a family physician here in Seattle. I work at the High Point Community Clinic in West Seattle. And I want to thank Michael Dillon Welch and the Washington Poets Association for nominating me. Um, I'm going to read three poems. Uh, they're from my new book, uh, What's Written on the Body, that came out recently from Copper Canyon Press. Um, this first poem is called Anagrammer. And you know an anagram is when you take a word like rats and you rearrange the letters to get another word like star 
or arts. Uh, and so this poem is based on words that are anagrams of each other. Anagrammer. If you believe in the magic of language, then Elvis really lives. And Princess Diana foretold, I end as car spin. If you believe the letters themselves contain a power within them, then you understand what makes outside tedious, how desperation becomes a rope ends it. The circular logic that allows senator to become treason and treason to become atoners. That 11 plus 2 is 12 plus 1, and an admirer is also married. <laughs> that if you could just rearrange things the right way, you'd find your true life, the right path, the answer to your questions. You'd understand how the Titanic turns into that ice tin, and debit card becomes bad credit. <laughs> how listen is the same as silent, and not one letter separates stained from sainted. This next poem is in the form of a dictionary. And for this poem, I took common medical terms and found the anagrams within them. And what was really fascinating to me was um, of teaching people evil and good, depending on who is teaching. The militia. Large lies, eager ills, antibiotics. Is it botanic, <laughs> appendicitis, septic, and I paid? <laughs> C-section, nice cost. <laughs> Dementia, I'd eat men, detain me. Diabetes mellitus, diet abuses met ill. Erectile dysfunction, Lucifer's indecent toy. <laughs> Flatulence, clean flute, gallstones, lost angels, heart attacks, that's a racket, lower back pain, incapable work, migraine, I'm in rage, neurotic, unerotic, surgery, Guy's air, vasectomy, my octaves, <laughs> whiplash injury, shh, I win jury, pal. <laughs> I was raised a uh, Roman Catholic. I'm a bit of a lapsed Catholic now. Some would say a collapsed Catholic. Um, <laughs> But one of the themes in, in what's written on the body is a re-exploration of my Roman Catholic upbringing, which I really did enjoy on some level. Um, and so this is a poem about baptism. It's called Holy Shit. <laughs> it used to be more private, just the immediate family gathered after mass, the baptismal font at the rear of the church, tiny as a bird bath. The priest would ladle a few teaspoons tepid holy water on the bundled baby's forehead, make a crack about the halo being too tight as the new soul wailed. We'd go home to pancakes and eggs. These days, it's a big Hollywood production. Mid-mass, the giant altar rolls back to reveal a jacuzzi tub surrounded by potted palms. The priest hikes up his chasuble, steps barefoot out of his black leather loafers, and wades in like a newfangled John as organ music swells and the baby-bearing families line up like jumbo jets ready for takeoff. But when the godparents handed my niece's newborn naked to their parish priest, and he dunked her in the jacuzzi's bath-warm holy water, her little one grew so calm and blissful, she pooped. 
Not a smelly three days worth explosive diaper load, but enough to notice. <laughs> As the godparents scooped the turds with a handkerchief, the savvy priest pretended he hadn't seen, swept through the felled water with his palm before the next baby in line was submerged. After mass, my niece sat speechless, red-faced, not knowing what to say or whether, as church ladies, friends, and family members presented one by one to the tub where the babies had been baptized as they knelt and bowed and dipped their fingers in and blessed themselves. Thank you. This is really great. Um, I'm Molly Tenenbaum. Everybody's so wonderful. I think everybody should vote for everybody like a hundred times. That's what I think. Um, thanks to Jack Straw for nominating me. I'll read a couple poems. This one is self-erasing. We were starving. We had nothing. But we had bread. There was nothing to eat. But there were plenty of tomatoes. We put the tomatoes on the bread. We had nothing. But we had garlic. We would put garlic on the tomatoes and bread. We were starving. We put olive oil on garlic, tomatoes, and bread. There were plenty of tomatoes, and we ate them on the hillsides with garlic and oil and bread. We were starving. We had nothing, but we had a cup. The cup was white inside, pink outside. The pink was a vine of roses. There was nothing. There was white and pink, and there were leaves. The leaves were gold paint in pink roses outside the white cup. Oh, we had nothing, the white in the cup and the pink and the gold leaves. Truly, we had nothing. Empty, starving, cold. There was a pond. We had nothing, truly. The pond was small. There might have been something, but it was small and dark. We couldn't see, but there were grasses at the edge. We saw them move, the water darken. We had nothing. We're so close to nothing, from our railings over our fence tops while we held our cup and ate our oil and bread. We looked into the pond. We couldn't see. We had nothing, but it seemed the blue pond was a thought that could undo itself and swim away. We couldn't see. We were starving. There was nothing. It was empty. It was oil and bread. It was a white cup. It was bluer and bluer. Here's um, a description of uh, my eyebrows. Once, a th it's called my eyebrows, as you might think. <laughs> Once a 300 pound man with spitty fat lips said, never pluck them. I've brushed them with red ink and pressed them on paper. I believe they're better in blue. I've lipstick and sealed them on letters, a kiss. I need negatives to unmirror the prints. I'll toss them on fabric stitch bristling skirts and when I raise my hem. Here, take my arch business card. In the park, I've wired a controller remote and zoomed them inches from your egg salad. Hey, race your kite. They've been tatting and grandmothers, foxtails and muffins, been mistletoe. They've been an old car throwing oil. When they are sad, they are bumpkins itching with straw. When happy, rabbits in lettuce. Sometimes they scurry below banks to hide from goodies. Now their names are Ginger and Pickles and one laps up haddock while the other topples the biscuit tin. 
In their shop, they sell boomerangs and springboards. In summer, they give free bouquets. In winter, they close, but you can come in. Swing the door to set off peal after peal of bells. Here's a bicycling poem for the slowest person, who's me, the person who's always the last behind. It's called a Prayer in Granny Gear. My huffy lungs, my loopholes, go with me wherever I go. I'm their speed, no matter the speed. So tippy, I can't lift my eyes from the pebbles, but heft my skull up quick. How far to the peak? Hey, where did they all go? They were riding ahead just a minute, or maybe hopped off at the top, took the lunches, now splay all relaxed in the trees, not me. On the road, the grasshoppers clicking along in the thistle. No crickets, perhaps they're asleep in the chicory. Leaves have sun and roots have gravel. Everyone has their own picnic. When I roll up to where they vanished, I can't. Bone and flesh weigh too much, or maybe I'm vanished already. A bare spot of rock underfoot sloshes like water, a wobbling cup. After such hard pedaling, how would I know if I all of a sudden were gone? And I'll read you one more. Um, this, is, this poem, we have a disadvantage. Um, if we did not live in Seattle, this poem would be totally metaphorical. But living in Seattle, this poem is um, so literal, it's almost ridiculous. But this is a Seattle event, therefore I will read it. But pretend you don't live in Seattle and you don't know what any of these things mean, and it's just, it's, the poem is called uh, My Viaduct. <laughs> My Viaduct. Beware blocks chunking off. Swerve left when the tow hitch ahead drops and sparks. Watch the flying hat. Wonder in the morning how at night those skid marks rode so high up the sides of the tunnel. Whatever it says, the billboard's untrue. I know a warehouse of olives under the clover leaves. Southbound, no signal, the radio crackles. Always the tow trucks parked. Always the tow trucks parked aimed at it. Always a sign with the dates they'll close it. Always what the council said. Always the callers for and against it. Something is going to be done about it. Always the end of life as we know it. Thank you. My name is Len Tews, and I'd like to thank uh, Poets West for nominating me, Glenn and uh, Barb Evans particularly. And I live on Capitol Hill, and uh, this is called, book is called Dance Steps in Brass. And some of you have been there know there are there, and it stuck me as a metaphor of what poems for that area would be. Let me start by the fact that there's a Tibetan Buddhist shop there called the Vajra Shop. So this is called Tibetan Prayer Wheel. My purest prayers are left unsaid. Each time I pass the Vajra Shop, I must spin the prayer wheel. Its silent script reels off the spool into 13 dimensions. Unspoken, the prayer wings back and enters my unsuspecting heart. It's then I feel the hunger of the sparrow hopping under the table at the outdoor cafe the suffering of the Labrador tied outside the post office. 
The bruises of the addict sprawled on the sidewalk in a running position. And even though these abrasions chafe until my heart is sore and tender, the prayer awakens the thump and thud of an unvanquished happiness. I sense the slow crawl of the shadow across the square in the afternoon. I become the glad gust of wind that whirls away the newspapers. And then the rest of the book has to kind of do with uh, characters there hang around that community. Uh, so I'd like to read one here called The General. He has a German accent thick enough to make you jump. Pay attention. He doesn't exactly stroll, cane clomping. This is not the park, you know, it's a street. He charges into people sipping lattes at outside tables or daydreaming in line at the supermarket where he declares a war of words like Socrates' question and answer time on any subject at hand. His lips, thick and mobile, are made for talking, drinking, arguing, eating, carousing, and kissing. He's certainly not spit and polish. No, he's more of a crazed general just back from the front with a luger in his hand. Are you the one that got over the wall? Like hard-won medals, he wears a jangle of political buttons that dangle from an old bomber jacket and hat that is Goodwill Austrian, Australian. But I love him. He cuts through all the crap to where people live. And I have to laugh because Seattleites are too overcast polite to know what to do with a man burning like that. <laughs> this was about a, that was a real character. And someone sent, showed him that poem. I didn't know what he think. He said, it's all OK. He said, but I don't do much kissing anymore. <laughs> <clears throat> this is called Real Change. There sits blind Susan on the street with hair in her eyes, selling real change, the paper for homeless people. But she knows some things never change. She'll never be able to read it. This was uh, for uh, the Jimi Hendrix statue, which is on Broadway. Ah, Jimmy, you are attic thin and flying high on speed and maybe purple haze, crazy in bell-bottom superfly shoes, tie-dye bandana and afro. On your knees, head thrown back, mouth open, eyes half closed in ecstasy, neck of your left-handed stratocaster erect, making love to the sky, lonely, begging the world to love you. Ah, Jimmy, you motherless voodoo child, you left Monica, your last blonde, in a London flat with six sleeping pills that became nine and drowned in your own vomit. You orphaned your music and us, your swirling, curving dimensions of genius, your hi-fi sounds are abandoned, left the electronic squiggles on tapes. Ah, Jimmy, the reds and yellows are gone from your bronze shirt. You've taken them aboard your Technicolor ship, your odyssey on the Rhine, wine red seas. We are faithful, Jimmy, and wait on this island, this grim third rock from the sun. Ah, Jimmy, the suitors press. We wait for your return. <clears throat> Dance steps in brass. Someone doted on ballroom dancing because on Broadway in Seattle there are brass steps, dance steps that were pressed into the pavement just before Ronnie and Nancy's reign. The rumba, the obipo, and the mambo. The charm of the prince was taken for granted eventually, step, turn, slide. And now the inhabitants hurrying to work or to love walk over them one, two, three, four. Yet tourists are tempted to place their feet over the footprints, laughing, trying to make the moves as graceful as himself and Ginger in T for two, turn and hold. Each dance step diagram, one pair of footsteps is that of a man, leading, broad heel, double D. And the other is that of a woman, petite heel, following, always dancing backwards, one, two, and dip. When these dances were pressed into the wet cement, probably with fuss and ribbons and pictures in the newspapers, everyone had to fit into these shoe prints. Others, quite politely, did not exist. Hold hands and bow. <laughs> that 
last one. Uh, there used to be a bus called number seven that ran from University District through Capitol Hill, downtown, and then down out uh, Rainier Square. So it really had a, <laughs> a lot of a combination of people on the bus, to say the least. A bus called Eden. I grab a seat on a bus number seven beside a woman. I've never seen the bus so crowded, I yell. She smiles, not understanding. I try my Spanish. Mucho gente, she nods. A man sells Jesus ticks, tickets for Armageddon. An elegant woman sways from a strap. Students fill the aisle with chatter from school. A disabled man in a pink dress gets on. The lift beeps and beeps as he backs his wheelchair on. Front seats are cleared. Everyone pushes to the rear. The windows steam up. The driver puts the bus in low gear and shouts, I'm not taking on any more passengers. You don't have to pay, just get off. <laughs> he shuts the door on a man standing in the rain. Pobre hombre, I say, she nods again. Without speaking, she takes out a knotted handkerchief and hands me a piece of juicy fruit. The bus suffers its way up Pine Street. Naked, we two innocents don't have to get out yet. So we grin and chew the gum. Suddenly, we feel so wise riding along in paradise. So, so thank you all for coming. Thanks to the poets for reading today. There are still refreshments here. And thanks again.
So, but I'm math. I want to make sure I was part of the group. Uh, Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I said hi. I think you yeah. saw Polish or Estonian or something like that. Not German. So that was fun. You're Broadway Yeah, I know. Yeah, I still think I could do anything with administrative. Who did the chat? Oh, yeah. I did. Yeah. Yeah. I used it myself. I do that all for Basically. And there's just a little bit of this one. Copper Canyon. I think I have saying the world. Yes. That's the one that uh, you always, I mean, all you, you just wanted to be a doctor yeah. like your mother. Oh, yeah, well, that's right. The boy who played with dolls. Can I just get a copper candy first? Yeah. They already have a Do you know what's in my suit? Open books. Okay, I'll let you Yeah. I'm going to hang around for a second. I'll take a look. I just wanted to meet you, though. Ignore the plane, just keep going. <laughs> oh, that's my. A situation where bad. Okay. Let's just start by telling me how the post populist role, I guess, as a person. Well, mostly I have felt extremely validated for a vision that I have had all my life of poetry belonging to the people, going out to the community, not limiting it to other poets, other professional poets particularly. It has, the poetry world has a reputation of being somewhat elitist. And I don't think that's because the poets want that necessarily. It's just that other poets seem to understand poetry in a way that poets outside of the world or people outside of that world don't. So. Yeah, that would help me too for you to say stop <laughs> because I'll go on forever. <laughs> my favorite subject, one of my favorite subjects. Man, my favorite subject, be honest. Okay. I, I like what you had to say, and if you want to continue on that, perhaps you could mention the poet populist, say it literally. Yeah. When the role of poet populist is meant to be. Yeah. So, so whenever you're ready. Just weave it in wherever. Yeah. Or start again, um, or you what? You can repeat what you just said if you like, or if there's something else you wanted to say. And you, you, what, you just, what I just heard you say was how it's fit in with your vision. Yes. Kind of a populist. Yes, taking the poetry outside of the elitist. Yeah. And, then, and then I thought that may sound like too much of a slam, and I don't really mean it that way. It's yeah. just that only other poets understand what's going on. Most people say, I don't understand poetry, I hate it. And they like people like Billy Collins who are accessible, and then the poets who are in the elitist group hate Billy Collins because he's accessible. He's I mean, popular. I, I like, perhaps you can start by saying um, how there's this all these various opinions of what poetry is. Yeah. And then there's this thing called poet populist and how that fits in with it. Well, I... Do you want me to start now? Sure, and maybe, again, mention poet populist. And you, okay. might, and you might put your... Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, tell me when. As poet populist, I especially valued that the, the parameters were expanded, that there are so many different interpretations, so many different ways of being a poet, especially in Seattle now. It's such a vibrant community or series of communities. And the poet populist, I think, enables us to embrace all of that. Whereas the former world of poetry was somewhat elitist, not deliberately, not intentionally, but appeared that way to people on the outside because without the training, without the education, they didn't understand most of the poetry. And the poet populist movement, I think, attempts to correct that in many ways. That's great. Okay. Fabulous. Now let me tell you how. <laughs> <laughs> now let's talk. Was, that wasn't my concern. I just didn't want you to lose something. Oh, okay. Go ahead. 
Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about your specific experience. Okay, one time. one example that I can give you about the poet populist world for can me. Start, can you start that over again? Okay. Um, my first assignment as poet populist was to go to Catherine's place. This is a place that has trans transitional housing as well as permanent housing for homeless families. The majority of the people that were there when I was there were from Somalia or Kenya or Liberia, but there are people from all over, including California. And so I felt that um, it was an invaluable experience to me because they were so appreciative of the opportunity to be able to communicate about their life experience, particularly in a creative form. They asked me if I would come back a year later, which I did last April, to work with the children to help them write. And it was a collaborative effort with two different poet, uh, two different um, artists and myself as a poet, and of course the children, and that's, that's what really mattered. And the name of the sculpture and the children's poetry was called Children Are the Window to the World. And the two artists made a beautiful sculpture and engraved the children's lines from the children's poems in the sculpture in bronze. So um, that's an example of what's possible to me when you move outside of the tight parameters that we're accustomed to in terms of the poetry world. So. Okay. Um, Something a hair in my mouth would drive me nuts. <laughs> let's, let's try that again, and the descriptions of the poetry I think are great in the collaboration of the artists. I, I wanted to maybe describe again, okay. and perhaps, I mean, how many homeless shelters have a poet come and, and read, um, and then also become involved in the, in the organization. Isn't that unusual? Yes, very unusual. Yeah, usually we're, we're reading in universities and in bookstores. That's maybe, usually about it. Uh, perhaps you could begin by saying that poet populace has been unusual in terms of my experience in that mm -hmm. normally okay. you have these contexts if you're okay. Like okay. whenever you're ready. Oh, just start whenever. The poet populist movement, at least my experience of it, was unique in that poets usually are invited to read at different universities, sometimes in libraries, and in uh, bookstores. But my first experience was at Catherine's Place, which is a shelter. It's more than a shelter, actually. It's transitional and permanent housing for homeless families, many of whom were from Africa. And I was invited to return in a year in order to, um, to work with the children, to do a workshop with the children. Before that, I came back for a day and took notes and interviewed the women, but it was difficult because I needed a translator. They Pause for a second. Let's, um rephrase that perhaps. I'm just trying to condense it down a little bit. Okay. So I'm thinking instead of, you don't have to necessarily give a lot of background as to okay. how you got there, but just the fact that here, here are the contexts within which poetry is most common, commonly delivered. Mm -hmm. And here as poet authors you found yourself in this rather unusual venue. Mm -hmm. And it worked because why did it work? Well, it worked because the children were so amazing and they had such an amazing experience. And one of the reasons that it, that it worked so well, it amazed me so much, is that when I had them writing wish poems, they wished that they could go back to Africa to help the poor and that they could also help the homeless. These were children who were from grade two to grade eight. And you wouldn't expect that kind of consciousness, that kind of awareness in children of that age. I can't begin to tell you what a rich experience that was, and I hope to go back and work with them again. And also, it was so wonderful to see them sort of strut. You know, on the day that I was doing the workshop, one of them in particular was very shy. He was the oldest in the room. He held his head down. He was almost afraid. He was very timid. And of course, you don't want to make it obvious that you're noticing that, but you want to do everything you can to encourage without making it obvious. But on the day that the awards were given, and he was one of the children whose poems were engraved, and his name was mentioned, he just strutted. I'd never seen, his head was up high, it was, it was beautiful. And these are some of the gifts I feel that are possible with the poet populist movement. I don't think I've ever experienced anything like that at a university. 
I'm sure it happens, but I, I don't think I've experienced anything quite like that.